Before the 8-8 plan, before many of their great plans, the Japanese had the 6-6 plan. And a cornerstone of the 6-6 plan was the asthma class. Which are... Well, let's put it this way. If in the 1890s you go to Armstrong Whitworth Ellswick's yard and you order two cruisers, you are getting Ellswick cruisers by definition. And Japan really liked Ellswick cruisers. They really liked Ellswick cruisers and they really liked what they could do for them. These vessels were protected, they were well armed, and they were well prepared. They were, in fact, pretty much some of the most finely designed and finely balanced cruisers constructed in their period, and they would be of great utility long after other vessels which are constructed at a similar time ceased to be functionally useful. Why were armoured cruisers, these specifically, these Ellswick cruisers, so important to all this? Well, it comes down to the founding principle of the 6-6 fleet. You see, when this gentleman, who is Yamoto Gonai, Count, Admiral Count Yamoto uh, Gonai, who also would be Prime Minister of Japan between 1923 and 1924, and 1913 to 1914, and Minister for Foreign Affairs, 1923 to September 1923, in, you know, for a few days in September 1923, basically when he was also Prime Minister, was Commander-in-Chief of the Navy and Minister of Navy who came up with the 6-6 plan. And his idea was quite simple. He was studying Japan's future naval needs. He was working out what do they need, what do they want. And he needed to expand the fleet, but he needed to expand the fleet in a cost-effective way to give them a world-class navy that could deter others. Russia was the most likely threat. And there was the potential of other combination of powers. So he was doing a sort of his own two power plan. Two powers is actually quite common. The French were worrying about the Italians and the Germans, the British, the Russians and the French and the Japanese, the anyone basically. Although they presumed it was highly unlikely that Britain and Russia would ever join together in a war against Japan, they couldn't rule out France or Germany backing up Britain. Eventually, of course, under treaties, it would be Japan that would be bucking up Britain. Useful. But there again, by that point, there was also Australia sailing around the world with its own battle cruisers. So, uh, by the time they were actually fighting alongside each other. Um, which is a very scary thing for anyone who's ever studied the Emu Wars. <sighs> very scary things. Anyway. He decided that if Britain or Russia were diverting from their other naval commitments, which were extensive, they could send either for they could send four battleships. Okay, they couldn't afford to send their whole fleet to the Far East, so the best they could send were four battleships. And there might also be some ships from a lesser power. So this is where he decides you need six battleships. He also looks at the depth of the Suez Canal. At that time it was only eight meters. And the Majestic class, which Britain was building at the time, had a draft which was equal to the depth and therefore couldn't tra uh, tra transit the tra canal. Now, this of course doesn't preclude the British doing something naughty. The British had already at this point been talking, uh, considering and had done occasional tests with sending ships through light, i.e. destoring them of everything they can 
transporting that separately if they had to, or just having more stores at the other end and sending the ship through. It is not exactly a comfortable or enjoyable experience for the captain, but it might well allow you to get something for a majestic class through the canal at that time without crying too much. But probably the captain doing this. My career! My career! My beautiful career! Life happens. This meant that they were likely that all warships would have to pass around the Cape of Good Hope. And again, it's kind of person for the Battle of Tashima and what happens to the Russian squadron. But the only navy which could really do this, he calculated, really do this, was the British, who had the significant coaling stations around the world, with the French being a sort of second, and Russians, perhaps, if they were able to call upon French support. That's what he's really calculating. That for anyone to do it without anything else, they would need support. Now, therefore, the minimum naval security Japan required was six of the largest battleships, supplemented by at least four armoured cruisers of 7,000 tons. Now, at the time when he was coming up with this, mm, there was already four battleships under construction. The Fuji and Yashima. He was very much an architect though of a balanced fleet. He didn't just want the battleships to fight the battles, he wanted the cruisers to be part of the force. And he would use the example that just as the army had the infantry supported by artillery, cavalry and engineers, so mass battleships be supplemented by lesser warships of various types. This meant he was seeking cruisers, but also destroyers, torpedo boats, and other vessels. Hence the program also included, rather like the British plan, when they were doing their naval acts in the earlier 1890s, 1889, etc. The program also included construction of 23 destroyers, 63 torpedo boats, and an expansion of Japanese shipyards repair and training facilities so they can support these vessels. It was an infrastructure heavy project. However, they then had to react. And whilst the original program called for four armoured cruisers, when they spotted the fact that the Russian building plans were far more aggressive than they presumed they would be, and the fact that the Russian Navy might decide to concentrate in East Asian waters, after all, what could they achieve in European waters versus the British and the French and the other nations? Well, six battleships might not be enough. However, at the same time, technology had also evolved, and the new Harvey, and more importantly, the Krupp cemented armour plates, could resist all but the largest of armour piercing shells, which meant armoured cruisers could take the place in the battle line, and this is something which the Japanese were thinking about, especially in a long-range engagement. It's worthwhile thinking that the battle cruisers being in a battle line doesn't come from nowhere. This has been thought about before, but this was in terms of a long-range engagement where you were firing at maximum range, and they could acquire extra cruisers. As a consequence, the 1897 revisions to the 10-year plan added an extra two additional armoured cruisers. These were the Asima class, to an extent. They become the Asima class, and also, I would have to say, the Izumo class, because these ships are all modified to an extent versions of each other. 
but it's important to know where they were thinking. They were already getting four of the largest, more, most capable armor cruisers they could to add on two more. And there was actually a discussion at the time. Various nations were quite not quite sure whether these ships were battleships or armoured cruisers. They seemed so capable. They seemed so powerful. More importantly, and perhaps more worryingly, they spoke of a navy, especially when combined with its infrastructure, which was digging itself in and building itself up to Western standards. To an extent, other navies had been expecting Japan to develop along lines which they'd already seen with China, with some of the South American nations, where they presumed they would forever lock themselves into buying equipment from abroad. The British seem to be the only ones, and especially this fe features into their sort of treaty uh, agreements, because the treaty allows them to retain a far more measure of influence than they might otherwise have had, an inkling of the fact that the Japanese were doing more. The Americans were especially shocked when the Amer Japanese were doing more. That they are actually building the infrastructure. This was a navy which was going to be built upon solid foundations. It was going to be able to sustain itself. Yes, the initial ships and initial grades they were buying to give themselves a leap into modern ships were foreign built ships. Massively from the UK, but other nations as well. But, the fact is, they were using these ships as a leg up to enhance and improve their own knowledge base, their own infrastructure, so they can jump in and start building at an equivalent level. Now, there is a problem with building the infrastructure in Japan, because they're building all these advanced yards, etc., and yet they don't build the infrastructure to sustain those yards. Let me explain. At many points I've pointed out the big problem for France is internal communications between the different yards. Now in Japan of course they have issues with earthquakes and various other things which can cause tremendous trouble. There's also the fact that your constantly dealing with a debate as to spending between the Navy and the Army. Alongside building the shipyards and infrastructure like that, you also needed probably a massive railway construction program and canal construction program to allow communication and ease of movement, especially of high, small high value goods, which a lot of which go into ships things like guns, things like bearings, etc. And of course moving raw materials such as steel and armour plates, etc. around the country without having to use ships to move it around. Now again, Japan was looking at the examples at the time and you have Britain and you have France, etc. as countries in America and all of them to an extent are relying on the sea for movement of such goods between the various operator facilities. However, there's a little bit of a cheat going on that you have to really think about before you can work it out. The British are cheating because they have these concentrations of industrial complex around the country. Whilst they have links internally between them, which do allow some movement, the fact is each of those complexes are to an extent independent military industrial complexes in that you can pretty much find everything you need in that area to build a ship. It might not be exactly what you want, but it'll do, and it'll produce a quality ship. To an extent, America is trying to push the same because of the distance between things, and France is a mess. France is just a mess. But Japan 
correctly diagnoses what it needs but not and starts to try and build it but not necessarily how it needs to set up what it needs because of those sensors looking viable it's also in a pre-submarine era so again these things seem more sensible one of the things you have to remember about the British is that whilst uh, it actually is to an extent a reduction in railways between like, the World War One era and World War Two, as there's a rationalization to extend to some railways there is also a recapitalization and improvement of railways in that period put forward by the four big the big four basically they put they do push and improve especially links between yards and infrastructure positions and they try and really sell and make the case for factory to yard railway lines that go directly between the two Off, little offshoots do pop up now the asthma class they displace between nine and a half thousand well roughly a little over nine and a half thousand tons fully loaded uh, roughly 134.72 meters overall length 20.482 meters in beam and a draft of roughly seven point seven and a half meters at four point four seven point four three. They had twelve cylindrical boilers supplying two triple expansion steam engines. I put supply didn't I rather than it's like the system I'm using keeps putting gaps between the M and the numbers because I'm putting in the facts and figures into Excel and it seems to do it. I, I think I've pressed the wrong button. I will sort it out. But it's just annoying me. Anyway. Two triple, steam, uh, two triple expansion steam engines to generate 18,000 indicated horsepower that drove two shafts for a top speed of 21 knots or a range of 10,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. Pretty good for the time. Complement 676. Okay. Armament four two hundred and three millimeter, that's eight inch, forty five type forty one naval guns in two twin turrets, fourteen single quick firing one hundred fifty two millimeter, six inch forty that's forty naval guns, twelve single quick firing twelve pounder, twelve hundred weight naval guns, eight single quick firing three pounder Hotchkiss guns, five single four hundred fifty seven millimeter. That's 18 inch torpedo tubes. That's a lot of firepower. That is a lot of firepower. And these ships, that's it, a lot of firepower. And again, one has to think they are completed in service in 1899. Again, one has to consider that America was very lucky in their choice of enemy because there are some ships wandering around the world which could have been seriously problematic. For their forces to take on, admittedly, if they was worked up as the Spanish were actually historically in 1899, then they'd have probably still won. But it would have been far more painful than the unprotected cruisers which the Spanish were trying to chuck into the fight. Waterline belt between three and a half and seven inches, or 89 to 178 millimeters. Let's finish this off. Uh, deck 51 millimeters. Gun turret, 160 millimeters. Barbette, 152 millimeters. Casemate, 51 to 152 millimeters. Conning tower, 356 millimeters. Bulkheads, 127 millimeters. Ouch! This thing is armored. I did not just check. Call the battleship there. It is an armored cruiser. I'm just just checking. It's an armored cruiser. And as you can see, this is the layout of their armament. The six-inch guns are in casemates, double stacked at certain points, which provides them with interesting capabilities and arcs of fire. But they do have four eight-inch guns, two twin turrets, fore and aft which allows for salvo firing at long range. This is important. 
having a broadside and it is a broadside of four eight inch guns and seven six inch guns gives them a very effective capability in terms of firepower. Combine this with the fact that they have five torpedo launchers and this ship suddenly becomes something which most battleships at the time whilst they might think they can win and be sure they can win we're absolutely positive we can win we're really really positive we can win they can't be a hundred percent sure the waterline belt as can be seen around the full length of the ship and its thickness varies between seven and three and a half inches thickest part of the belt covering the middle of the ship for roughly 86.62 meters. It will, had a height of 7 feet of which normally 4 foot 11 inches of it was underwater. There's then an upper strake of belt of armor as you can see above it which is 5 inches thick and this extended from the upper edge of the waterline belt to the main deck. It covered 65.42 meters in the center of the ship. Now, their bulkhead, their armoured bulkhead, is at the front and closed off the forward end of the central armoured citadel. The torpedo tube at the front, the above water torpedo tube in the bow, was enclosed by a 23 by 9 foot, that's 7 by 2.7 meter patch of 6 inch armour. They had 32 watertight compartments in their double bottom, an additional 131 between the bottom and the upper deck. This is a ship which is designed to be survivable. This is a ship which is designed to probably take you with it, and all your friends, and all your friends and families. Pretty much everyone. And here's the real secret of success of the 6-6 fleet, and this is what the Japanese really push for. They standardized their turrets. All the 8-inch gunships had the same turret. So did all the 12-inch gunships. So it doesn't matter if their ships produced to slightly different designs or produced by slightly different constructors. They have pretty similar operating capabilities so they can operate together but most importantly they have the same turret and same turret mechanism which means they can standardize training which means they can generate crews more easily it means you can have officers jump from one ship to one ship and NCOs jump from one ship to one ship knowing what to do to operate their guns it makes logistics so much easier it makes maintenance so much easier it makes building up the necessary supplies to support them so much easier. This is a very scary concept for other nations to deal with at this point because there are nations which are not pulling of this off which are far higher up the scale of naval powers than Japan is at this point. And this is what makes the 6-6 fleet as successful as it is and makes it as capable as it is when in 1905 it decks to the Battle of Tsushima. Which, unsurprisingly, both these ships take part in. I'm so surprised. Ah, the Asana. Now, the 1896 plan that, that started this all had been made after the First Sino-Japanese War. and as said was modified after the Russian building program to be a 6-6 fleet. The important thing about Asuma and her half-sisters were they were not focused around commerce raiding or defending colonies and trade routes. That really wasn't their role, although their trade route defence they certainly did have the capability for and did take part in, and certainly were able to do trade route defence and convoy defence although perhaps not in the same way as others would do it. But what they were was to be fleet scouts 
and to support the battle line. This is why they're as heavily armed and as armoured as they are, and it's why they can scare some battleships at a time. And pretty much every other cruiser built at this time would go, You want me to take on an Asima? Have I completed my will? Good. Fine, I will take her on. But please note, I do not expect to be coming back, because I will pound her, and I might well sink her. Eventually, she might sink from the damage I inflict, but the odds are my armour will sort of break out a lot earlier before she, than she, hers does. What can I say? She's designed to make sure her opponents... Hmm... Don't get that. That's what she's there for. Now, she's named, of course, after Mount Asma. And... She'd already been laid down at the Ellswick shipyard as a speculative venture when she was started. So, she's laid down to an extent by Ellswick because they know what Japan's looking for. So they lay her down and start building and then they go, Oh, you've turned up. Oh, well, we've got this ship which we're already building, which might suit your needs. And the Japanese look at her and go, Take the money. Take the money. We want it. We want it. She was launched in 18, March 1898, completed in, by the 18th of March 1899, and left for Japan on the 9th A very good day, and always an auspicious day, 19th of March. It turns up quite a lot in history, it seems. It's a very special day. And arrived in Yokosuka on 17th of May. 30th of April 1900, she was used by Emperor Meiji during the review of the fleet at Kobe. In July 1902, she was the flagship of Rear Admiral Ji Ijin, who was sent as the part of the delegation to the United Kingdom for the coronation review of King, for King Edward VII in Spithead. She also took the time while she was there to visit Antwerp and Cork. And during the outward leg of the voyage, tested British radio technology between Malta and Britain. This was useful. During the Russo-Japanese War, she took part in the Battle of Chilumpo Bay, the Battle of the Yellow Sea, and of course the Battle of Toshima. And she was then part of World War I and the interwar activities. In fact, she was reclassified as a training ship in 1942 and was a gunnery training ship in Stryamonsky. She was disarmed to the point that she only had anti-aircraft guns later on, but yeah. She fought in... World War Two, World War One, and the Russo-Japanese War, and their hull was useful in all of them. Her sister, Tokiwa, was no less a committed a vessel. Also managing to take part in the Russo-Japanese War, she added the Battle of Ulsan to, uh, to it all, the Battle of Toshima, and in the interwar period is converted to a mine layer, which means in 1941, She's actually doing duties as a mine layer. She was actually at one point unsuccessfully attacked by USS Salmon. Although was mined herself in the 14th of April 1945. Suffering moderate damages. And then damaged by B-29. Superwaterist is doing mining. But It's sort of a case of that on the 30th of November 1945 she's removed from the Navy list. But this is after she's been mined twice and bombed during the Second World War. And her wreck is refloated after in 1947 and scrapped then. It's just, it's just amazing what these ships get up to. Oh, and I, I forgot to mention she was actually damaged by aircraft from the USS Enterprise in February 1942. 
this ship, these, these ships do not understand the concept of we have done our duty, we will now have a rest. No. They fought in the battle, uh, they, they, they fought in the battle of Toshima and did severely nasty damage to the second and third Pacific squadrons. Tokoa was third in line of six when Togo opened fire on the second Pacific squadron. Third in line. She engaged the battleship Osalaba, which was unsurprisingly under weight of fire, forced to withdraw. When Kinazov um, appeared out of the mist at 15.35 hours at a range of roughly 2,000 meters, all of Kamimura, uh, uh, Kamimura, Kamimura's ships, which was included Tokua, engaged her for roughly five minutes, with Azuma and another armor cruiser, Yakuma, also firing torpedoes at the Russian ship, although these didn't hit. But let's be honest, it's just getting nasty at this point. At 17.30 hours, Kamura left, uh, led his cruisers off to try and hunt down the Russian cruisers and Toga left Toga's battleships to their own devices. At 18.03 hours, he turned north to rejoin Togo, but on the way back at about 18.30, he spots the rear of the Russian battle line and goes whoopee and charges straight in. They open fire at a range of roughly eight to nine kilometers and cease fire by 19.30 hours and rejoined Togo at 20.00 hours as night was falling. Again, they spotted the Russian ships the next day and started firing on them. It was at this point that um, Rear Admiral Nikolai Negobokarov uh, decided to surrender his ships as he could neither return fire nor close the range because the ships he was firing at were, fi were firing him were firing from beyond his range and were capable of moving at speeds greater than he could. Tokua, over the course of the battle, was struck by one large and seven small shells, mostly the smaller shells striking it with 75 millimeters, and um, they killed a crewman and wounded 14, but otherwise caused owner only minor damage. In 1910, her boilers were replaced by Imiabara water tube boilers, that's locally produced for uh, units, and her 6-inch guns were replaced by Japanese-built models. In December 1911, Tokoa was deployed to Port Arthur to um, keep order there during the Chinese Revolution. What is it about these ships that is quite so cool? It's what they achieve. This is a lovely colorized photo of what Plymouth, uh, Asthma would have looked like at Plymouth in 1902 for the coronation review of King Edward VII. This is what she was dressed ship would look like. And it really is quite a cool effect, the black and the white. It looks... These ships were very powerful statements. The 6-6 plan is not just about Japan building itself, saying to the world, we're a power. It's about saying, was to be taken seriously. And we have vessels you have to take seriously. It's also interesting to not going for the commerce raiding route. Japan theoretically looks like the weaker power. America's gone for a commerce raiding cruiser. France has gone for commerce raiding cruisers. Why is Japan not? Well, because they're looking at the other power, which isn't. And the other power, of course, is Britain. Britain does have some SARS cruisers. And they do, can do commerce raiding, but they're not going to do it the same way that Russia, France, or America's going to do it. 
But Britain, it's about commerce control, not commerce raiding. It's both denial of your opponent's commerce and support of your own. And that's the thing where these cruisers come in. So when we say that they can't do commerce warfare, we're being rather simple or sim uh, rather monofocused. We're just looking at one of the one way, the traditional way to do it, and if they can't do it that way, they can't do it at all, which isn't the case. It's just not. They can do it, but they do it a different way than others, and they're good at it. They're capable. These are good ships. And they give Japan what they need, which is basically a second line. And here is the problem. Because they do so well, people start to think, well, maybe, maybe. Especially once you get to battle cruisers and you get into the the Grand Fleet and you're looking at the size of a battle cruiser, it's impressiveness, you're sitting there thinking, well, hang on, the Japanese armor cruisers were part of Toshima, so that obviously shows they can achieve that. And that leads to the fact that the Russians actually getting to Toshima is a frickling amazing feat of logistics and leadership, which frankly is obscene how amazing it is to actually get those ships there. If you look at the quality of pre-dreadnoughts and all the other things they had going on against them, frankly, those ships should have died long before they got anywhere near the 6-6 fleet. And long before they got anywhere near this force, which is still the cornerstone of Japanese force at this point, they should not have been functioning. But they get that. And that is cool. They get that. But when they get there, they are facing a fleet which has been standardized ruthlessly. Which has been built to a capability that these ships are definitely on the line between battleship and armored cruiser. They're about as battle a version of the armored cruiser as you can get. Heavily armed, heavily armored. Yes, they're capable of doing the armored cruiser role and that's what they're there for. But they are being built with the idea that they are a second line. That they are the ships they need to back up the battle squadron. And that changes things. It also cha should have changed the way people approach them because you're not fighting a normal squad, you're not fighting a traditional squadron which is cruisers and battleships, you're fighting a fused force. And that should have also clued people in that the Japanese were listening to discussions going on, the papers which Fisher and others have written, which they themselves have written, about the development of long-range artillery and concentrated salvo fire. Dreadnought doesn't come from nowhere. The idea that produces Dreadnought, the unified, for, uh, unified all big gun armament, doesn't come from nowhere. But neither does the tactics and doctrines of Tsushima. All this stuff has been developed, and the fact that there's that the Japanese really are working on it back in. 1896. They're confident enough about it that they are pursuing it as their policy when they are putting together the plan that becomes the 6-6 plan. And the Asima class... Well, Ellswick Ordnance Company... Uh, Ellswick... Armstrong Whitworth and Ellswick are um, watching... and Ellswick Ordnance Company as well as part of them are watching Japan very closely. And they are producing ships on spec, and this is a very big ship to be producing on spec. The odds are, let's be honest, if the Japanese had bought, hadn't bought it, the Royal Navy would have bought it. Because the Royal Navy was not going to let that go to anyone once they saw it get further along. But the fact is, the Japanese wafted in and stole it as early as they could, because it was perfect for them. 
fitted their needs and their requirements to a T. Everything they wanted, up to and including the guns which they'd been wanting to standardise on. Yeah, someone did some good, good speculating there. So what we've got coming up? Our refuser classes next week. This will come out on the 20th, I think. Let me just check my Excel spreadsheet. It feels so much more, you know, organizing. No, this comes out, the Asthma class comes out on the 19th. The Diadem class will have been yesterday when this comes out. And the Cressy class will be the last of the 19th century cruisers to be looked at. And that comes out on the 21st. Just checking that the Cressy class are not like the um, <laughs> Columbia class. I haven't already done them. I don't know. And I refuse the class the next week. It's funny to think that we are a couple of weeks, when this comes out, we're going to be a couple of weeks away from Christmas, away from all sorts of specials. So I hope you're going to enjoy them, and I hope you're going to look forward to them. I realise there are very few 19th century ships planned in this set, and I've done a lot of a fair amount on them. But that's because I wanted to finish off the Soviet Navy, and I wanted to look at some of the more modern cruisers as well to see and to examine what exactly has survived of the cruiser legacy into more modern cruisers and to, I suppose to an extent to try and make the case that it might not be politically correct but the cruiser as a concept is a very useful concept to retain the ships it provided are a very useful concept to retain and maybe we shouldn't be so quick to get rid of the name thank you for watching hope you enjoyed and well the question I'm gonna put is I'm gonna ask you to do a bit of investigation because I know a couple of ones but I want there are at least two other occasions, to my mind, where ships have been built on spec, speculatively, that is, and have turned out to be absolutely perfect for the nations which were hunting for them. I would love to see if you know if anyone knows what ships those are. I have a feeling there are a fair people, a number of people who watch this channel who will know, but I'd love to hear. Then there might be more I don't know about. There's always that chance. I would love to say I knew everything about naval history, but honestly, I'm a perpetual student of it. I'm just passing on my passion. And I always worry when anyone else says, once you've got your PhD, that makes you an expert and you don't, you stop learning. No, a PhD means you have reached a certain level of research skill and independence in terms of your research and quality in terms of how you assess and, uh, and identify sources and how you then pass that information on it doesn't mean you've learned everything or know everything and what else yes I'm going to add this in as well please if you've watched any of the other episodes you'll know what I'm just about to talk about yes it's Christmas is approaching the bet between my mum and my aunt they're twins, and family betting of each other is fairly common in my family. They're things, in this case, it's a baked cake on one, baking a cake on one side. It's a big, big um, basket of bath stuff. It's basically what, fancy bath stuff. Uh, on the other side is the, the prize for winning. If uh, it's all on based on whether or not I get 10,000 subscribers by Christmas, <sighs> please, it'll make my mum very happy because she'll win the bath stuff and we'll stop having this thing come up. So if you do like the channel, please 
If you haven't subscribed, subscribe for my mum to get the bath stuff. And um, please share. Suggest it to people who might not watch the channel who you think might enjoy it. Anything to help because, well, it's the third year and under our family rules, whoever wins the bet gets to pick the next bet. And so far this has been a very good winning project for my aunt. So she's kept setting the bet. So um, yeah, if my mum wins it, it's over and I stop having to hopefully have these things happen. There's also numerous side bets going on on the channel. It's quite Oh, anyway. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and take care.